Has the United States economy officially entered into a recession? What exactly does it mean to be in a recession? And how is skyrocketing inflation contributing to the shrinking economy? We're happy to have with us Heritage Foundation's E.J. and Tony. E.J. and Tony, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. E.J., uh, my first question for you, what is a recession? And more importantly, are we in one? So a recession is essentially just a prolonged period of economic contraction. And that's exactly what we find ourselves in right now. The classic definition for that is when you have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. And that's, again, exactly what we've had for the first quarter and now the second quarter of 2022. EJ, we're obviously seeing and feeling the pain at the pump uh, and at the grocery store. Um, as the reality of this all sets in, uh, can things get worse or where do you see things going from here? You know, it's a very difficult uh, question to answer where things are going to go looking forward because so much of it depends on reversing the bad government policies that have got us here in the first place. And unfortunately, we don't really have much good news. The latest coming out of Washington is that Joe Manchin apparently has signed off on a new version of the Build Back Better Green New Deal boondoggle that the Biden administration has been trying to push through using the reconciliation process. So that is only going to add fuel to the inflationary fire. It is only going to continue the stagnant economic growth that we've seen so far this year. That was actually going to be my next question for you. Senator Manchin, who's uh, just contracted, tested positive for the CCP virus, uh, he seems to have budged on this uh, massive um, Build Back Better plan. It's now being dubbed or as an offshoot of, of Build Back Better, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, what are some of the things in there that you think will have a counter effect to bringing the inflation down? Well, a key one is the fact that it's going to tax American coal, oil, and natural gas, really the backbone of our energy markets and the backbone of the American economy. And if you're trying to bring down prices, if you're trying to fight inflation, the last thing you want to do is increase the costs of production. But that is entirely what this bill aims to do. Just kind of uh, on a slightly different uh, note, where does the housing market go from here between another historic rate hike and uh, the economy in recession? Uh, where does this all bottom out and is the worst yet, yet to come in terms of housing? You know, the housing market is really in a very unique place right now. So again, it's it's very difficult to predict where it's going to go moving forward. What makes the current market so unique is the fact that the Federal Reserve has purchased so much debt that is backed by American mortgages. And that can very well affect what the Federal Reserve does moving forward in terms of interest rates. And this Federal Reserve, once again, unfortunately, has proven to be highly unpredictable. They have said one thing and then turned around and done another. So we really do not know which way this Federal Reserve is going to go. They are likely going to continue raising interest rates, at least for the short term. But it's unclear whether or not Jerome Powell is going to have the spine to continue pushing rates as high as they need to go to really combat inflation. E.J. and Tony, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. A two-hour-long call between President Biden and Xi Jinping. What are Washington and Beijing saying about it? And how are rising tensions over Taiwan playing out? NTD's Iris Tao has more. Amid rising tensions over Taiwan, President Biden talks with China's Xi Jinping for two hours and 20 minutes in their first call in months. It comes as Beijing is warning of forceful actions if House Speaker Nancy Pelosi indeed visits the democratically ruled island of Taiwan. In Chinese state media, quotes she as warning Biden that, quote, those who play with fire will perish by it. But the White House declines to say it marks an escalation. Um, they had a, a very direct um, conversation. Um, and that uh, they've known each other for some time. And the U.S. says that Biden underscored to Xi that the U.S. strongly opposes unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. And in addition, 
Uh, he raised um, uh, genocide and forced labor practices uh, by the P PRC. That is something that he raised um, and he, uh, about the human rights, as he always does. But the White House says Biden and she also talked about working together. Uh, with particular focus on climate change and health security. And Senator Ted Cruz tells NTD's Melina Weiskub that he thinks the administration is being too soft on the communist regime. The United States should not purchase electric vehicles that are made with slave labor in concentration camps in China. And I've suggested we name John Kerry the customer of the year for the Chinese concentration camps because he is the single largest purchaser of, of products that they are ma be made under forced labor. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. Tensions between the U.S. and China arising as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced her plans to visit Taiwan again. How do her Republican colleagues view this trip? I chatted with Congressman Brad Wenstrup about the trip and U.S.-Taiwan relations. Congressman Brad Wenstrup, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, as always. Thank you. Congressman, I want to ask you about uh, Speaker Pelosi. Uh, she's planned a trip to Taiwan. She's faced uh, some, some pushback from the Pentagon and the executive branch, uh, advising her not to go. I guess, first of all, why do you think that is? And second of all, do you think that that is proper advice? Uh, I'm surprised that they're engaging, and especially engaging publicly, if they have an opinion like that, to, to not go. I think that she's the Speaker of the House, and whether I agree with her on, on anything at all really doesn't matter. She's Speaker of the House. I hope if she goes, uh, that she goes in a, with a bipartisan group, as opposed to what was done when she went to Ukraine and just took Democrats. I thought that was inappropriate. But uh, I think it's important that we engage with, with Taiwan. They are certainly a, a key trading partner for us. and so. Why why not? And if the White House is saying don't go, I'd be very curious as to say, why not? Uh, we've always had a relationship with Taiwan. Why not continue it? I know they're afraid it might offend China. Look, I, I, this administration, you know, what they did in Afghanistan, for example, they set the date of August 31st. We're going to get out. We're going to be out August 31st. You don't, first of all, as a military man, that to me is not good strategy telling your enemy what you are going to do, or for that matter, we tell our enemies what we're not going to do. And, and in that case, in in Afghanistan, that, that became the red line for the Taliban. They gave us the red line. You better get out by that day. This isn't who the United States is. We are a superpower. We need to continue to work from uh, a, a, a component of strength, but in the, in the nature of providing peace. We want peace, peace through strength. And I'm not sure why they're saying don't go talk to Taiwan. Um, you know, if you think back, uh, President Trump, when he first got elected, they made a big, the Democrats, and the left made a big brouhaha over him even talking to the leader of Taiwan. You might recall that. Indeed. Congressman, I want to ask you, I mean, with this on the table right now, there's rumblings of a potential invasion. Outside of the speaker visiting Taiwan, what else do you think the U.S. can do to try to prevent such an act? Well, one of the things is what we're doing in Ukraine and, and what the Ukrainians are doing. So the combination of our involvement, Europe's involvement, and uh, that in, and what the Ukrainians have been able to do on their own, their morale, their strength, their courage, I think these are lessons that that um, China is trying to learn from. What I would caution the White House about is understanding that China is looking at what we have done with sanctions, for example, on Russia. And they're going to learn from that. They're going to try and learn from that and try to avoid that type of a situation. Look, they want to take Taiwan. Look what they did in Hong Kong uh, in going against the agreement and the accord there. They want to take Taiwan. They just want to do it at the right time. And let's try and make it so there's never a right time. Congressman, I want to switch gears a little bit. You're a physician. Uh, you're also a member of the Doctors' Caucus. Um, right now, the Democrats are talking about, um, you know, federalizing um, drug prices. Um, can you tell us why you think that's not a good idea? Well, uh, first of all, I think one of the things out of the chute is they're robbing Medicare to then subsidize the Affordable Care Act, and that's just money going to insurance companies. That's not even going to patients for care. Uh, but that's the way the, the bill is written right now. It, 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 with the intent of taking money from Medicare to go to the Affordable Care Act. So uh, the other problem with it is when you start getting involved with that and you start capping prices and, and dictating prices from the government, it stymies innovation. And we are the leading 
country in the world when it comes to innovation, treatments, new therapies, and we want that to continue. But when you start getting the government involved with capping prices rather than a, than a fair market and a free market, then innovation is going to be shut down. You won't have the ability to get a drug to market perhaps because they'll say, well, we're not going to pay for that. So, and if we do, you can only charge this amount. If you don't agree with that and you go and charge your regular amount, they're going to tax you. They're going to tax you on your gross revenues at uh, what, 95 percent. This is a terrible idea, but it's obviously a way they want to force people into this program. But I'm afraid that we will lose our pharmaceutical industry in the United States because they don't have to be here, but we certainly want them here. Carson Brad Winstrip, thank you. Thank you. Yesterday, we aired the first part of our interview with Senator Cynthia Loomis of Wyoming. The issue of China purchasing U.S. farmland and other agricultural infrastructure came up. I asked the senator why this is such an area of concern. Here's what she had to say. Well, as I see more and more land being taken out of production in the western United States because our own Bureau of Land Management is buying agricultural land so they can turn it into recreational land and take it out of ag production. And then you see other countries come in, China specifically in this case, to buy American farmland uh, and keep it in production, but not for Americans, presumably, uh, we are putting ourselves in a precarious position. Uh, we are already a net food importing nation, meaning we produce less food uh, than uh, we export. Uh, and so we are becoming dependent on foreign countries uh, for our food supply. To me, that's a national security interest, and it's something we need to watch very carefully. So you've recently said that we are pursuing the United States uh, energy policies that are making America weaker. Uh, how so? We have the ability to not only produce enough energy for the United States, but also to export energy around the world, especially liquid natural gas. Now, we could be sending liquid natural gas to Europe to help them wean themselves off of Russian dirty natural gas. Ours is much cleaner burning. Uh, but we have four liquid natural gas terminals with uh, permits applications just sitting there pending. Uh, and if those terminals could send our liquid natural gas to Europe, uh, it would help them meet their needs and get them weaned off of Russia. Furthermore, if we could send LNG to India, India could use clean burning liquid natural gas, so they quit burning manure, which is horrible for the environment, and they would burn less coal, and we could help them emerge uh, from being uh, an emitter. So if we were serious in America about climate change, really serious, we would recognize it's a global issue and that we can do more to help the world's climate uh, implications to the extent that mankind is having a huge impact on climate. If you believe that, we should be helping India. We should be doing everything we can to help Eastern Europe and India, which are the big emitters in addition to China. We're not going to be able to help China. They don't want our help. They're going to emit uh, till the cows come home. But we can help India, we can help Eastern Europe, we can improve their air quality, their health, and at the same time sell our clean burning liquid natural gas and create American jobs in America, and at the same time make the whole globe's air cleaner. It's a no-brainer we should be doing this. Very interesting point. It sounds like you're suggesting that within the climate debate there's a lot of contradictions. Oh, there, it, we're hurting the cleanest burning hydrocarbon country in the world. That's ourselves. And in doing so, we're hurting the global climate. We are, by our policies that are driven by radical environmentalists, making the global situation worse when we could be making it better. Senator Cynthia Loomis, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is resigning from the law school course that he has been teaching at George Washington University. 
The course's co-instructor, Judge Greg Maggs of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, broke the news. In an email to the university, Maggs said that sadly Thomas is unavailable to teach the course this fall. Thomas is also no longer listed as an instructor for George Washington University. Clarence Thomas ruled to overturn Roe v. Wade along with other conservative Supreme Court justices. The university had refused to fire Thomas from its faculty after he faced a backlash from thousands of George Washington University students who signed a petition asking for his removal. Students and others have been protesting outside of the school, raising security concerns for Justice Thomas. Naomi Biden, President Joe Biden's eldest granddaughter, announced that she will be married on the South Lawn of the White House this fall. The young Biden is tying the knot with fiance Peter Neal. There has not been a White House wedding reception for a family member since June of 2008. That's when former President George W. Bush threw a reception for his daughter, Jenna, a month after she married Henry Heger in Texas.